I'm Ava Kadiwara, one of the chief internal medicine residents this academic year. Welcome to Grand Rounds this Thursday morning. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Sean Whelan. Dr. Sean P.J. Whelan is chair of the Department of Molecular Microbiology and the Marvin A. Brennecke Distinguished Professor at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Dr. Whelan received his BSc degree in microbiology and biochemistry from the University of Birmingham and a PhD in molecular virology from the University of Reading. Following postdoctoral training at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, he started his own laboratory at Harvard Medical School, where he was promoted to professor in 2011. At Harvard Medical School, Whelan was head of the program in virology and director of an NIH-funded center on emerging virus entry mechanisms. In 2020, he joined Washington University in St. Louis. He pioneered reverse genetic approaches to manipulate the genome of vesicular stomatitis virus. This work led to the field domesticating the virus as a vaccine vector, an oncolytic agent, and one licensed human vaccine against Ebola has been developed using this technology. Dr. Whelan's group used this genetic system to develop biosafety level two reporter viruses against 80 viral pathogens, including several biosafety level three and four emerging viruses. Using those viruses, his laboratory identified the cellular receptors for Ebola, Lassa, and Lujo viruses, and for the endogenous human retrovirus, HERV-K. Dr. Whelan's group also pioneered structural studies of the replication machinery of non-segmented negative strand RNA viruses using negative stain electron microscopy and electron cryo microscopy, where he solved the atomic structures of vesicular stomatitis virus and rabies virus polymerases. Most recently, Dr. Whelan's group has built upon the VSV platform approach, developing a BSL-2 reporter of SARS-CoV-2 entry and neutralization by antibodies and receptors. Dr. Whelan's group has advanced this VSV SARS-CoV-2 vector as a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, demonstrating efficacy in mouse models of disease with the Diamond Laboratory and advancing testing of this vaccine in non-human primates. He joins us today to discuss the impact of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein variation on therapeutics and vaccines. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my slides. So uh, before I uh, start, I should disclose some financial interests that I have, um, which relate to patent applications that have been filed by the uh, School of Medicine here for the use of uh, VSV SARS-CoV-2 as a biosafety level two reporter of SARS-CoV-2 infection, and also an application that's been filed by WashU on VSV vectored vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. I also have ongoing research efforts in my lab that are the subject of sponsored research agreements with Via Biotechnology, AbV, and SAB Therapeutics on SARS-CoV-2 uh, antibodies and polyclonal sera. So I've had a long-standing interest in emerging and re-emerging infections of humans. And what's summarized on this slide are those emerging and re-emerging infections uh, that we've had to deal with over the last 20 or so years. And I've uh, modified this slide that I took in fact from uh, the NIAID website uh, by highlighting uh, with these asterisks, all of those viruses, all of those emerging and re-emerging infections that are caused by lipid enveloped viruses. And uh, that's because they comprise about 65% of all of these emerging and re-emerging infections. Uh, and also because we have advanced the platform approach to study the envelope proteins of these viruses. And these are the proteins against which uh, neutralizing antibodies are typically developed and are the targets uh, of uh, most vaccine uh, uh, programs. So with the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 in late 2019, the world became remarkably familiar with coronaviruses, which had been up until the beginning of this century, a rather uh, poorly studied group of viruses um, because of their uh, lack of serious disease uh, in humans or lack of any serious disease associated with them in humans. They had been, um, studied predominantly as the, because of their uh, 
uh, importance in agricultural pathogens as agricultural pathogens, uh, particularly in livestock. But the classic appearance of a coronavirus is you have this crown-like structure that's visible in these negative stain electron microscopy preparations of a virus called mouse hepatitis virus. Um, and this is a schematic of the virus particle and you see this extended spike structure that's the surface protein of the virus particle that mediates attachment to cells and initiates the process of infection. There are a couple of other membrane proteins in the virus, the membrane protein M and the envelope protein E, um, but this is the protein that mediates uh, attachment and membrane fusion to initiate the process of infection. So the replicative cycle of these viruses is summarized in this diagram that I took from a, a relatively recent uh, textbook, uh, Emerging Viruses, uh, with a coronavirus chapter written by uh, uh, Perlman and Masters. Um, the virus actually binds to receptors at the cell surface. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, this is ACE2. In the case of MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, this is DPP4. And in the case of SARS-1, it's also ACE2. This binding alone isn't sufficient to lead to infection. You need a proteolytic activation event mediated by Tempris-2 or Tempris-4 and or by uh, endosomal cathepsins during the process of endocytosis. What this does is it releases into the cell the viral genomic RNA, which because it's positive message sense uh, is immediately the, used as a template for translation by ribosomes. And this establishes the formation of a membrane vesicular compartment on which this input genomic RNA can be replicated to produce a variety of subgenomic RNAs that serve as templates for production of viral proteins and allow the replication of the genome of the virus and the subsequent assembly and budding and release of virus particles. Um, we know uh, or knew the most about this process from studies of prototypes of the uh, coronaviruses, particularly mouse hepatitis virus uh, and some uh, avian uh, pathogens in the, in the family. With the appearance of SARS-CoV-2, um, we've also uh, become acutely aware of the impact of coronaviruses on human health. And in fact, there is this enormous uh, uh, spectrum of diseases that are seen uh, following infection of humans uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, in most individuals, the illness, uh, the infection results in mild febrile illness or asymptomatic infection. But as we know, um, there are severe presentations of the disease which can result in uh, serious uh, complications, hospitalization and death in the US alone, over half a million deaths uh, in uh, the period of a year since the introduction of the virus. This has spurred an enormous amount of research and response to try and combat um, this uh, virus. Um, there are many therapeutics that have been advanced and developed, and we now have uh, vaccines that have received emergency youth or use authorization, as you all know. Um, and there are many therapeutics, uh, including uh, therapeutic antibodies, that are designed to target the spike of the virus and impede the processes of viral attachment to the cell, neutralizing um, virus infectivity attachment or some post-attachment step in some cases. Um, and this in fact is the target, of, this is the goal of most uh, vaccine strategies to elicit the production of neutralizing antibodies and also to generate cell-mediated immunity. There are a whole host of other molecules that are in various stages of clinical and preclinical development that, that block additional steps of the virus replicative cycle host protease inhibitors that target the entry pathway, including which are molecules like camastat, uh, 
um, uh, that are preclinical molecules that target uh, the molecules in clinical de development that target other um, uh, kinases that are involved in this internalization process, the small molecules and peptides that are in, uh, involved in inhibiting the fusion and the coding steps of virus infection, the vi viral protease inhibitors that are involved in cleaving what is a polyprotein that's immediately translated from the viral genomic RNA um, uh, that target the viral proteases that are necessary to liberate the viral individual proteins from this polyprotein. And there are viral polymerase inhibitors, among which are remdesivir, that uh, I'm sure you've all heard of, that target the viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and new uh, cytidine analogs that are being advanced that were initially developed by uh, against influenza um, uh, that have quite uh, good efficacy against the polymerase of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, and that are now being advanced um, by Merck as a uh, polymerase inhibitor. And then there are viral maturation inhibitors that are in uh, stages of preclinical development. Um, but as I said, the goal of uh, vaccines and many uh, therapeutic antibodies is to block the process of viral entry and the initiation of infection of cells. And in fact, this is also how convalescent plasma, uh, which has been uh, used and tested as a potential therapeutic, uh, also works. There are antibodies that, uh, in convalescent plasma that block the entry of the virus into cells. So, We've known about the emergence of variants for quite some time. And this uh, paper was a paper that came out um, uh, early last summer that reports on what was uh, essentially the first variant of concern that um, uh, people were alerted to. And that was a single amino acid substitution in the spike gene of the virus at residue uh, 614, which was switched from an aspartic acid uh, to a glycine. Um, and this was reported to increase the infectivity of COVID-19 virus. And in fact, what's shown in this uh, uh, graph in looking at the prevalence of D614 versus G614 in blue of the spike is you can see that G614, which emerged in Europe, very rapidly replaced globally um, the D614 variant of SARS-CoV-2. So this was the first uh, um, sort of variant that we became alerted to as a uh, new variant of concern. And it's thought in the case of, or early on it was thought in the case of G614 that this is working by increasing the infectivity of the virus uh, that's released in fact, that came from studies uh, using a pseudotyping assay where the spike protein was used to decorate a reporter virus, in this case, a vesicular stomatitis virus that was expressing a marker gene uh, in response to uh, following infection. And when the reporter virus was pseudotyped with the G614 spike versus the D614 spike, um, you can see that we uh, observed higher levels of infection on Vero cells, uh, 293 cells that overexpressed ACE2 and 293 cells that overexpressed ACE2 in the protease that cleaves the spike Tempus2. And so this led to the uh, uh, model that, um, uh, that there were, this change was associated with an increase in the infectivity of the virus. And that's why uh, the virus had, this variant had displaced the D614 version of the spike globally. So I took this uh, from today's New York Times of all places. I had not expected uh, a year ago um, that I would be looking at three-dimensional atomic resolution structures of the spike protein of an envelope virus uh, as a regular feature in the New York Times. Um, but that's one of the positive impacts of the pandemic. I think that uh, uh, the public awareness 
of uh, the science of virology and immunology has increased enormously. Um, but this picture nicely summarizes, in fact, three of the key variants of concern um, that are present right now. Uh, there's the B117 variant, the B1351 variant, and the P1 variant. And I will talk more about each of these during my presentation. But what's shown are some of the features uh, of those variants. This is not a complete list of all the mutations in the variants. So in the case of this variant, there's a truncation in the spike um, that deletes a couple of amino acids here and here. Um, there's also the acquisition of an amino acid substitution at residue 501, which goes from N to a Y. And then there's the acquisition of a substitution a proline to a histidine substitution at residue 681. In this variant, this is also uh, uh, referred to as the UK variant. It was first observed in the United Kingdom in December. Um, there is this variant, um, which became known as the South African variant, but is, well, it became known as B1351, was known as the South African variant. It has N501Y, uh, a substitution E484K, and, a res and another substitution K417N. There are additional substitutions not shown on this uh, three-dimensional di rendition of the spike, um, and there are additional substitutions elsewhere in the viral genome. And then this is the Brazilian variant, um, or, or Japanese variant, um, also called P1. And uh, this has uh, N501Y K417T as opposed to N and E484K. And these have become sort of the three variants of uh, most significant concern. This variant was associated with significant reinfections in a population that had already largely been infected. And so people were extremely concerned about the appearance of this variant. So I'd like to take a minute to talk first about what the source of viral variation is molecularly during the replication of these RNA viruses. And so really the intrinsic problem is that the, uh, the error prone nature of RNA virus replication. So RNA viruses typically, although as I'm going to show you, coronaviruses are the exception to this rule, they don't have a proofreading activity for their viral polymerases. And their mutation rates are one in 10 to the three to 10 to the six, which means that approximately each time the genome is copied, the polymerase makes one error in copying per genome. Uh, by contrast, the proofread proofreading activity that's associated with DNA viruses leads to a significantly lower polymerase error rate. And if you think about the eukaryotic host organisms of viruses um, and you try and compare the time spans by which these different evolution, by which these different mutation rates can influence evolution of the virus or the host, um, you could generally consider that the host organism uh, requires a geologic uh, time span to evolve to the same sort of degree that an RNA virus can achieve in a single human generation. So what this high intrinsic error rate of an RNA polymerase does is it ensures that the viral genome isn't always present as the same copy. So if you perfectly copied, if we represent all the possible sequences that could be explored through copying of a viral genome as a theoretical space within this box. If you perfectly copy the viral genome each time, you never explore any of that sequence space. If you have a highly imperfect replication mechanism, you will explore rapidly all of this sequence space. Instead, what happens with RNA viruses is that they exist uh, as a quasi-species that reflects the error rate of the viral polymerase. And so they explore some of this sequence space. And this is actually important for the, uh, this has functional consequences 
for the replication and pathogenesis of RNA viruses. So typically, uh, the polymerase error rate uh, is about the reciprocal of the genome length, uh, and this results in each genome uh, differing by a single nucleotide. And so what happens is the virus exists as a swarm of variant sequences around a core consensus sequence. And this is the unit of selection uh, that occurs, on which all selection occurs during viral evolution. And so this concept is actually uh, um, based in mathematics. It was developed uh, uh, first by Manfred Eigen, uh, and it's focused on the Darwinian evolution of self-replicating molecules. And this uh, was uh, appreciated to apply to all RNA viruses, DNA viruses, bacteria, uh, stem cells, tumor colonies, immune effectors. Um, but with RNA viruses, because of their high mutation rates, you get this extreme variation. And so you have this mutant swarm of genetically distinct but similar individuals that behave like a single biological unit. So what's the biological goal? Well, if you think about where the mutations are made, the impact of that mutation is going to be different. Um, substitutions, you can have nonsense mutations that introduce termination codons and create problems or missense mutations that alter amino acids like the ones that we're seeing in the spike. You can also get deletions, again, like the ones that we're seeing in the spike. You can also get insertions. We haven't had so much uh, attention uh, focused on insertions. Uh, in fact, I'm not aware of any that have become uh, variants of concern. Um, but with any mutation, the effect is always position dependent. One can imagine that if you make a, a point mutation in a key promoter uh, for the enzymes that replicate the viral genome, that could have quite a detrimental consequence for viral replication and would be rapidly lost from the variants. And of course, it depends on whether it's in a coding or non-coding region. So what, what are the advantages, if you like, with, from the viral standpoint? Uh, of this quasi-species. And so uh, in this uh, schematic that I actually adapted from uh, um, a dis discussion of the uh, advantages of quasi-species diversity for poliovirus, um, you can see that uh, each one of these dots, each one of these triangles, sorry, represents a variant from the core consensus sequence of the viral genome. And some of these variants will have advantages uh, in escaping antibody-mediated neutralization or cell-mediated immunity, or they might allow acquisition of um, a new host tropism uh, through acquisition of a new receptor or adaptation to a host, a different host's variant of the same receptor, or they can result in more efficient host-to-host -host transmission. These are just some examples. This is not an exhaustive list, but the, these are relevant in considering some of the variants that we've seen with SARS-CoV-2. Um, it seems that some of the new variants uh, have enhanced transmissibility uh, in humans. We know, for example, that acquisition of substitution M501Y leads to the ability of the virus to use not only more efficiently the human version of ACE2, but it also allows use of mouse ACE2. And we also know that variants within the population, uh, within the quasi-species that are generated by replication of SARS-CoV-2 have also spilled over into other hosts like mink. Uh, we know that cats and dogs and various other species can be infected by this virus. Um, and I'm going to talk some about variants that have escaped uh, antibody-mediated immunity and also uh, impacts of these variants on vaccine-induced uh, immunity. But before I do that, I also want to point out another source of genome diversity in these viruses, and that's um, that this diversity is enhanced by a process called RNA recombination. And this, uh, process is exchange of sequence information between two 
RNA molecules than it occurs during the process of replication. So if you look, for example, at um, this termed donor molecule of RNA, this black dot is the viral polymerase, it's copying this molecule of donor RNA into a progeny RNA. And then some error happens that causes the polymerase to pause during the process of replication, which leads to a typically a backtracking event during the process. And that exposes a little bit of the nascent three prime end of that RNA molecule, which can then base pair with a different RNA template molecule. And this encourages a process of strand switching during the process of gene of RNA synthesis. And the end result of this is you get this hybrid RNA molecule that looks like the three prime end of this one strand and the five prime end of this other strand. And so this process can occur uh, for most uh, positive strand RNA viruses. In fact, we know that this occurs with coronaviruses too. So what's known about mutation frequency in coronaviruses? I alluded earlier to the fact that they have uh, unusually a proofreading enzyme. And that's because the genome size is so large. The genome size is about 30 kilobases. Uh, this, uh, a lot of RNA viruses have a genome size of 10 kilobases and under. And so if their polymerases had similar error rates, um, then you would accumulate a lot more errors in the viral genome during replication. And this can actually be detrimental to the viability of the virus. Too many mistakes in the various proteins um, can cause a dominant inhibition of viral replication. And so the uh, way that this virus uh, replicates, the details of this slide are not critical, um, but it produces a large polyprotein, um, two large polyproteins uh, from the uh, translation, uh, translation of this uh, open reading frame that uh, comprises the non-structural proteins of the virus, ORF1A and ORF1B. And among those proteins are the components of the viral replication machinery. So the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase uh, is shown here in red. But this polymerase molecule is recruited by these other non-structural proteins onto the template and into the uh, replication complex, requires also unusually a protein that's an exonuclease, this NSP14 molecule. And what this does is it recognizes errors that are created by the intrinsic polymerase error rate of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And during the process of backtracking, it excises those errors, which then allows, it helps the polymerase, if you like, to correct errors that are made during RNA replication. And so this reduces the error rate during copying of a coronavirus genome template in a way that isn't seen for other RNA viruses because they lack an equivalent protein. So, um, Vesicular stomatitis virus is a negative strand RNA virus. And I, I uh, want to share with you the fact that this has a polymerase molecule that doesn't have a proofreading activity. It only has an 11 kilobase genome. And we've taken advantage of this fact that this virus doesn't have a proofreading activity in order to uh, generate more rapidly errors in the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And the way that we did this was we um, were motivated to do this first by the fact that uh, previous work had demonstrated that replacing the surface protein of this uh, livestock pathogen BS, uh, BSV with the surface protein of Ebola virus had ultimately led to the development of a licensed human vaccine, uh, Ervivo, that is distributed by Merck um, and that is effective against Ebola virus. 
And this uh, uh, results in the induction of a robust neutralizing antibody response against Ebola um, and can protect against infection. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the goals of my lab was to essentially do this uh, with SARS-CoV-2 uh, and test whether or not we could generate a coronavirus vaccine using an analogous approach. So we generated a recombinant BSV in which we, we replaced the surface protein of that virus with the surface protein of SARS-CoV-2. And together with Mike Diamond's lab, we compared how well this VSV SARS-CoV-2 chimeric virus uh, uh, compared to a clinical isolate of SARS-CoV-2 with respect to neutralization by polyclonal sera from humans who'd been infected with SARS-CoV-2, a series of monoclonal antibodies, and also soluble human receptor decoy molecules that were being advanced as therapeutics. What, what's shown uh, here is that the curves, the neutralization curves uh, for human sera are essentially uh, um, similar between the chimeric VSV and a clinical isolate of SARS-CoV-2. That's also true for these five monoclonal antibodies that we tested. And it's also true for these soluble receptor decoy molecules. Uh, in both cases, the human ACE2 soluble molecule neutralizes the virus, viruses with similar efficacy, but the mouse ACE2 soluble molecule was unable to neutralize. So this validated this biosafety level two tool um, as a uh, means of measuring uh, molecules, antibodies, sera, and soluble receptors uh, that can neutralize uh, the chimeric VSV um, in a way that is comparable to how they would neutralize a clinical isolate of SARS-CoV-2. So because the polymerase error rate of vesicular stomatitis virus is uh, much higher than that of SARS-CoV-2 because there's no proofreading activity, what this then allowed us to do was to take antibodies, including some that were being advanced clinically, and to rapidly interrogate um, what mutations could be acquired by the viral spike that would le lead to resistance to antibody-mediated neutralization. And we initially started doing this with some antibodies that had been developed by our colleague Ali el in the pathology and immunology uh, department um, following uh, immunization of uh, mice with um, a recombinant spike protein that had been produced by uh, David Fremont's lab. And then those antibodies were humanized. So we took one of those antibodies, 2BO4, and we grew VSV in the presence of the antibody. And what you can see is that we were able to select a variant of VSV that rapidly escaped neutralization by this antibody. This is these black dots represent plaques that form on a monolayer of cells. And in the presence of the antibody, we're inhibiting the replication of the overwhelming majority of these uh, infections, uh, except for this dot here, where the virus seems to be spreading. We can pick these uh, uh, spots and then determine the sequence of those uh, variants and map those mutations back onto the spike protein. And when we did this, what we could see was that we had isolated three individual substitutions, two at position 484, an E484A mutation and an E484K mutation, and one at position 486, F to S substitution, all of which grew indistinguishably in the presence of the antibody to the absence of the antibody, as shown by the similar sizes of the plaques under both conditions. When we map those mutations onto the surface of the receptor binding domain of the spike, these are the regions that make contact with ACE2. You can see that F486S is in this position here, which is directly an ACE2 contact site. And E484A and K 
map to this position, which is adjacent to the uh, uh, receptor, uh, to key contact residues uh, between ACE2. And so this suggested, in fact, and this was subsequently uh, uh, and had been confirmed sorry, by structural studies, that the way that this antibody impedes infection of SARS-CoV-2 is by blocking ACE2 engagement. Um, but this also demonstrated what escape mutants in the virus could lead to resistance to 2B04. We used this approach with a large panel of antibodies, including some additional ones from Ali, 2HO4 and 1B07, and several from our colleague, Mike Diamond. And the details of these residues don't actually matter, um, but it allowed us to map onto the surface of the spike protein. Um, mutations that led to resistance to individual monoclonal antibodies. We then interrogated our panel of mutants that we obtained for their sensitivity to neutralization by soluble humanase 2. Particularly, in, we were particularly interested in this because many of the substitutions were in and around the ACE2 binding site. And what's shown here is that for uh, substitution F486S, we were unable to efficiently neutralize this virus, even at extremely high concentrations of soluble ACE2, more than um, could be uh, achieved um, in any uh, physiologically relevant uh, manner compared to our wild type uh, recombinant. And so this argued that uh, escape um, at this position would lead to resistance to soluble human ACE2, um, which was being advanced as a candidate uh, therapeutic. So if we look then at the ability of each individual variant that we selected to be neutralized by other monoclonal antibodies in our panel, we were astounded and we plot the degree of resistance by uh, increasing the uh, intensity of the red color shown on this uh, um, plot here. Uh, we were astounded to see that some substitutions like E484K led to quite broad resistance against our panel of monoclonal antibodies, whereas other substitutions like this S477R led to uh, resistance to a smaller cluster and other uh, uh, substitutions like this substitution A352D really were only effectively uh, eliminating the neutralization activity of this antibody. But we were concerned to see this extent of variation, uh, sorry, this extent of resistance associated with substitutions at residue E484. So we tested um, whether uh, substitutions at E484 and also a second position, S477N, which also was associated with quite significant uh, cross resistance, um, to uh, human sera uh, from patients who'd recovered from SARS CoV 2. And uh, we were limited by the amount of sera that we had, but we were unable to detect at the uh, concentrations that we used, um, neutralization of any of the variants that we uh, had observed at residue 484 by these four human sera. And so this suggested that um, uh, natural immunity induced following infection was also not potentially going to protect against mutants that arose uh, in the spike. We tested then, we obtained additional sera and tested them against a larger panel of individual substitutions. And what's shown here in this heat map are um, substitutions that led to a higher degree of resistance. And again, one can see that uh, E484K is associated with really quite significant resistance across each of these donors, sera. Um, and other substitutions of residue 484 uh, were also associated with quite significant resistance. Um, this substitution 
is present in both the South Africa and UK variants. And so this alerted us that this uh, variant uh, exhibits reduced sensitivity uh, to human uh, immune serum. Um, we've used this approach also to isolate variants that are resistant to two monoclonal antibodies. In fact, we took some of Ali Elabedi's antibodies um, and the variants that we selected against those antibodies and asked if we could select um, uh, additional mutants. So in this case, we took the two BO4 resistant variants, E484A, E484K, and F486S, and asked if we could now select resistance on this background to 2HO4, and the answer was yes. And we obtained additional substitutions, uh, including this um, is an unfortunate typo, this is an R at this position, 346, um, but we were able to select um, additional substitutions uh, elsewhere that mapped to the um, second antibody site that we had um, uh, selected against. And so we were able to isolate variants with two or more substitutions that exhibit resistance to both antibodies, um, which would be a challenge for combination therapy um, uh, involving these two monoclonals. So now coming back to the variants of concern um, that were um, discussed again in today's uh, uh, paper. Um, we have now generated, in fact, uh, using our recombinant VSV approach, um, uh, viruses in which the full complement of substitutions found in the UK strain, the South African strain, and the Brazil strain, and those substitutions as shown here by these red boxes, um, the, the full complement of those substitutions we've now introduced into our uh, virus um, so that we can probe to what extent immune uh, sera from vaccinees uh, and from um, people who've recovered from infection can still neutralize these variants. Um, we're not the only people who've been doing this. Um, uh, uh, several groups have been doing this, and I'll share with you some work uh, from my colleague Mike Diamond uh, in a moment on some studies with uh, um, the, a clinical isolate of SARS-CoV-2 and introducing the point mutations uh, that I've just shown you. But we've tested several of our variants against a polyclonal uh, a human immune globulin that was uh, produced actually in transchromosomic cows that had been immunized with um, a recombinant spike to generate a, a polyclonal product. And in fact, we can see that even though some of these substitutions like E484K lead to significant resistance to uh, human immune sera, these, this uh, material that's been produced following immunization of transchromosomic uh, cattle so that they produce a human IgG um, actually can still quite effectively neutralize even E484K uh, as shown here. Um, what's shown by these different colors and multiple boosts um, in the immunization of the, of the cattle. And you can see that the uh, uh, sera can still relatively effectively neutralize. There is a rightward shift compared to the wild type sequence, um, but it can still effectively neutralize uh, these variants. And this work is uh, currently in, in, in uh, submission for publication. Um, but I, I mentioned that my colleague Mike Diamond had also tested uh, some of the sequence variations in spike um, that have been seen in the South Africa, UK, and Brazilian uh, variants. In fact, Mike published this uh, wonderful paper in Nature Medicine recently that was a tour de force collaboration um, with uh, many folks here at uh, WashU, including uh, Rachel and Jane, who've been instrumental in collecting uh, um, uh, vaccinees, Sarah, uh, 
Um, and uh, it's been a collaboration between Ali, Peyong Shi, and Mike Diamond. Peyong have generated some of the variants in the backbone of uh, an infectious molecular clone of SARS-CoV-2. And what they did, I'll just summarize one figure from this paper, is they uh, compared the efficacy of sera from vaccinees uh, who'd received the uh, Pfizer uh, vaccine, their ability to neutralize, um, uh, in this case, a variant that has E484K, N501Y, and D614G versus the D614G alone. And what you can see is that in each case, the vaccine was like the vaccine the vaccine sera was less effective at neutralizing this collection of substitutions in spike. And similarly, here's um, a, a comparison with the South African variant, and uh, this is a comparison with the Brazilian variant. You can see that uh, the South African variant has uh, less sensitivity uh, to neutralization uh, from following vaccination with the Pfizer vaccine. And so this um, is only one attribute, of course, of vaccine-induced immunity, but also T cells uh, um, that the vaccine will induce. Uh, and this is just looking at a cell culture in vitro neutralization assay. There are antibodies that can offer protection that don't mediate viral neutralization. Um, and, but this does nevertheless uh, emphasize the importance of um, uh, monitoring the sensitivity of new variants um, to uh, neutralization and uh, potentially updating uh, vaccines on the basis of this data. So um, where, where are we with uh, uh, vaccines? Well, I was encouraged this morning, actually, while I was um, uh, having some coffee before giving this talk, um, to see uh, how things are moving with regard both cases and with regard vaccines uh, uh, are present in the country. So it's estimated that about 3 million doses a day of vaccine will be available by the end of this month. And we're currently uh, um, giving about 2.17 million doses uh, on average per day. But despite the fact that the new variants um, are present, particularly the UK variant, broadly throughout the country now, um, we're not seeing a major uptick. We're seeing a slowing in the downturn uh, of new cases, but we're not seeing a major increase uh, in new cases. Even though the new variants are the predominant source of infections in many parts of the country, some other good news is that you know, in some states, including Alaska, now anyone over the age of 16 can be vaccinated. Uh, and so I, I think things are moving in a very rapid and positive way with respect to vaccine. But the goal really is to uh, in, induce herd immunity in the population to slow the progression of infection. And this uh, movie that I'll, I'll play or this GIF that I'll play sort of illustrates the impact of vaccination and natural immunity uh, uh, also plays a role here on infection. And so what we're really doing is slowing the spread. Uh, and even though new variants have arisen that might be more infectious and in some cases more lethal, um, it's now estimated that almost 40% of the US has some sort of immunity uh, to um, the uh, virus, either through having received one dose or two doses of the vaccine or through having received um, uh, or through having been infected. And so um, what this does is it buys us time uh, to increase the number of folks who have been vaccinated. And if we can get to this sort of stage or this sort of stage, then even though we are seeing the emergence of new variants, the vaccine is, um, is still offering some immunity that will protect and the uh, vaccines can be uh, updated in response to uh, the sequence of new variants. So in the last couple of minutes, I'd just like to summarize some directions that we're proceeding with work that's happening in my own group, uh, 
which is to ask the question, can we anticipate where the spike protein is evolving and study its consequences in advance um, for therapeutic monoclonals and for the vaccines? And this question really came from uh, some of our early work that we did in selecting variants against two antibodies that we obtained from our colleague Ali, uh, 2B04 and 2H04. And what we noticed when we initially plotted um, on, on these plots here, uh, the variants that, that had arisen, if, if we could detect them in, in sequences of human isolates, we marked them with a red box. If they hadn't been seen in human isolates, we color them black. And when we first started doing this, um, the um, frequency with which we could see E484A or E484K in the human population was extremely low. And now, of course, these are becoming the dominant variants, uh, particularly E484K. And we're seeing this, uh, we've repeatedly seen this actually throughout Spike. Uh, and some other examples are those shown over here with uh, 2HO4. We're seeing residues that evolve in, func in spikes that we know are functional, at least in cell culture, in the context of our chimeric VSV, that then subsequently we obtain evidence uh, um, through sequencing of human isolates of SARS-CoV-2 that it can be detected in human isolates. So where do we currently stand with this? Um, so if I uh, uh, look a little bit, zoom in a little bit onto the receptor binding domain, you can see that we have several residues that we've seen um, uh, that haven't at the time been seen in humans. Some of this has now been updated. Um, and uh, if we plot the frequency with which we see them in humans, um, for example, we were uh, relatively early on detected this substitution at residue S477. In fact, S477N was the substitution, um, but but we were relatively early in picking up on the E484 uh, substitutions. Um, and um, we've seen substitutions at other positions in the RBD um, uh, that uh, arose in our recombinant VSV uh, before they'd been seen in, in the human population. So the current state of play with our variants is shown here. We have several that still haven't cropped up uh, in the human population. Um, uh, and these are in the, in the background of uh, a wild type spike. This is the old D614 spike. And this is in the G614 spike. We have uh, a number of variants that haven't yet uh, been seen in humans. And so what this allows us to do is to actually study the properties of these spikes in the context of an infectious replicating competent virus and ask, do any of these have a fitness advantage? And are these substitutions something that we should be worried about? Uh, and so we can compare that to the sequence of circulating strains of virus and say this substitution is or isn't something that we need to be concerned about uh, in advance of um, uh, um, based on, on the properties of these substitutions with respect to vaccine-induced immunity. Uh, and so this may help improve um, the, uh, so combining this with broad surveillance may help uh, anticipate the need to update vaccines uh, with time. So what we're trying to do is essentially anticipate where the virus is going and the evolution of the next uh, uh, beta coronavirus. Um, we've seen the emergence of SARS, MERS, and SARS-2 uh, all this century. Um, they've all come from uh, uh, a common ancestor. Um, um, bats are thought to be an important uh, vector of these viruses, um, but as I've indicated earlier in my presentation, these viruses can infect multiple host species, and uh, these may serve as important intermediates uh, in the path to transmission to humans and in, in uh, transmission from humans to other animals and then potentially back to humans uh, as has been seen uh, uh, with SARS-CoV-2 in this pandemic.
So with that, I'll uh, acknowledge some of the people in my own group who've been involved in some of this work, uh, Paul and Jomin and Michael and Louis, along with several others, many of our collaborators and uh, sources of funding, including NIH and, uh, and uh, WashU. And with that, I'll stop and if there's time, I'll answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Whelan, for taking us through all of that work that your lab has been doing. Um, we do have a couple of questions that we'll do the next few minutes here. Um, so the first question is about the J&J &J vaccine. Um, does a stabilized protein used for the Janssen vaccine have any of the escape mutations allowing the Janssen vaccine to, protect, to provide protection against the South African Brazil variants? So the, the initially approved uh, vaccine, I do not believe, uh, well, in fact, I know it doesn't have uh, those mutations, but that vaccine was tested and, and the new vaccines that are coming online have been tested uh, uh, in uh, South Africa. Not only that, um, what we're seeing also is a significant reduction in transmission in South Africa, um, which I, you know, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that the vaccines do more than induce neutralizing antibodies. They induce the production of antibodies that are not neutralizing, that have a protective effect, and the cell-mediated immunity that's also important. Um, and I, I think the data that are coming out of South Africa that show that despite the South African variant being a, a key variant of concern, that the um, immunity that's induced following natural infection or vaccination is leading to a reduction in um, uh, infection in the population. And so I think we have more reason to be optimistic um, than pessimistic. And uh, I, I think, you know, the concern is eventually the virus will drift away in a way that may require us to really update the vaccine. And we need to stay one step ahead of that so we can anticipate it. Um, because we have these wonderful platforms, the advected uh, vaccines and the mRNA vaccines that have been uh, approved within the space of a year. And um, uh, they protect against severe disease and hospitalization even with many of the variants that people are concerned about. Okay, perfect. And that actually leads us into well, leads us well into the next question, which is asking if you kind of predict that this COVID vaccination will be flu-like in the sense that these ongoing mutations will become an, an, an annual occurrence for us where we must try to anticipate and vaccinate yearly. Um, so the, the frequency with which we will need to update the vaccine, I think is, is, is a big unknown uh, right now. I mean, one hopes we don't have to do it yearly. Uh, one hopes we can be a little less um, uh, uh, frequent than with flu. With flu, the big challenge there is with the viral genome being segmented, you can shuffle segments and then you get quite rapid um, uh, shift antigenic shift um, that, that leads to a, a loss of efficacy of the prior year's vaccination. Whereas the mutations in the flu HA, uh, that, that process is called antigenic drift and that just reduces the efficacy of the prior year's vaccination. And so we hope that, and, and maybe I can speculate and say, it's unlikely that it will need to be an annual um, vaccine. Um, but, but that would depend upon how long the immunity from the vaccine lasts. We have every reason to believe that's going to be extremely durable, particularly based on data that's coming out of uh, labs like my colleague Ali Elabedi's lab, um, uh, who's been studying the immune response and even taking samples of bone marrow from vaccinated individuals and looking at the memory response. Um, and so I think uh, we have every reason to believe that vaccines will induce long-lived immunity. All right, wonderful. Um, I think that's all the time that we have for questions this morning. I will go ahead and share my screen so that people can um, get credit for conference and go about their day. Thank you again, Dr. Whelan, for join joining us this morning and providing this important update officially one year into the pandemic now. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation.